Uh, this has been a good week. And uh, very, very grateful. How many know the steps of a good man are order to the Lord? Amen. Steps of a good person are order to the Lord. And it was uh, about a month ago or something along that line, received a, a text from, from uh, evangelist Randy Ruiz, and he's been with us a number of times. Somewhere I think we figured around 20, 25 years or so coming. And um, said, man, I just we had a cancellation on this weekend. Is there any possibility? And, you know, I'm serious about this. Some things you don't even have to pray about, you know. It's just the right thing to do. I said, absolutely, let's make it work. And so we looked at the schedule. We did a Friday night, a Saturday night, and then this morning. And I'm very, very grateful that um, the Lord put this together for this weekend. And um, if you've been paying attention, you know that the message that's been coming during this revival is very much aligned to what's been happening in this congregation in recent weeks confirmation. Now, I will say this, and I'm getting ready to turn it to, to Randy. Uh, please, please understand when I refer to him by first name, that's not a disrespect. Uh, we're friends. We've been friends for a long, long time. The Evangelist Ruiz, uh, they, they headquarter out of Springfield, Missouri, and um, he has to catch a flight at 1.30. He has to, uh, they start loading at 1.30. So um, here's the thing. Um, he's going to preach, and uh, we're going to come to the altar. So if you see uh, Randy and I slip out, not before he's finished preaching, but <laughs> when he's preaching and we come to the altar time, please do not let that be a clue that we need to shut things down. Everything's going to be left in good hands, Pastor Isaac is going to be uh, still here, and he's going to be giving some direction, and uh, Michael also helping with the worship. So if you see us slipping out, it's because we have to get him to DIA. And um, we ordered, a, no, we didn't, but I was going to say we ordered a, a helicopter to come. <laughs> get us. So <laughs> that didn't come. So anyway, I'll get him there, and we'll, we'll make it. And so we're going to be in good shape right now. And by the way, the, the water baptism, do see me. Uh, we have a class for the water, all who are going to be baptized in water. Uh, we have a class the Sunday before, and uh, you'll need to participate in that class. All right, right now, take your word out and make a good welcome to Evangelist Randy Ruiz. Uh, he, he's so cute. He's just cute. That just... <laughs> hey, turn to the person next. You just smile and say, you are the best looking thing I've seen all day. Just say, man, easy, Jim, easy now, easy on the front. Now, <laughs> I do that because hopefully you're sitting next to your wife or your husband. If you're not, hopefully you're sitting next to someone you wish was your wife or your husband. And if you're not, I'm going to ask pastor to do it next week. And if you're single, sit in a good spot. <laughs> Scope it out to try to help you girls out. Hey, Jake and Bessie found each other in their old age. Jake was 92 and Bessie was 89. And they fell in love and it was so wonderful and they decided to get married. And one day the engaged couple went to the local pharmacy. And they went to the pharmacist and they said, uh, pardon me, sir, uh, wondering if you sell heart medication here. And he said, yes, we do. And how about medication for arthritis, Parkinson's, and jaundice? He said, yes, we sell that as well. And do you sell Geritol and dentures, and do you sell reading glasses? He said, well, yes, sir, we have that as well. Well, what about wheelchairs, canes, and walkers? Do you sell those too? And he goes, yes, we have all of that. And he says, wow, that's great, because I'm going to marry this young lady, and we want to register for our wedding gifts here. <laughs> oh, getting old is not for whims, amen? <laughs> I thought that was so cute. <laughs> well, praise God. You are in the right place at the right time for your miracle. Amen. Say that with me. We are in the right place at the right time for a miracle. If you believe that, let's clap our hands one more time for the Lord. Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, get your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Kings, the 30, uh, 2 Kings chapter 20, 
verse 35 through 37, I have got a prophetic message for you. I want to speak to you on wounds that heal or wounds that God uses through your life to bring people to healing. And we're about to read an amazing story that I came across in my own personal study, and it so caught me that I meditated on it for many, many weeks, really many, actually months, before I started to understand what the Lord was saying. So follow me now in 2 Kings chapter 20, starting verse 35 through 37. Now a certain man of the sons of the prophet said to his neighbor by the word of the Lord, strike me please, and the man refused to strike him. Then he said to him, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, surely as soon as you depart from me, a lion shall kill you. And as soon as he left him, a lion found him and killed him. And he found another man and said, strike me please. So the man struck him. Notice inflicting a wound. Then the prophet departed, waited for the king by the road and disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. Jump down to verse 43. So the king of Israel went to his house sullen and displeased, And then came to Samaria. One translation says, heavy under conviction. That he went to his house, heavy under conviction. This is one of those random stories in the Bible that really don't have any lead up to it. God doesn't explain to us why it is there. He basically leaves it up to the reader to glean from it the hidden diamonds that are in the text. So if you will allow me to unearth some of those diamonds, I believe it will speak to your heart prophetically. Uh, And you can begin to really grow from it. In the text, we are told that God instructs a prophet, a no-name prophet. And by the way, the word prophet simply means teller of the truth. And we have no idea who this man is, but we do know he's a prophet. And God says, go find somebody with a sword, maybe a soldier, we don't know, and ask him to strike you. Now, the Bible says the first man looks at him and says, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, listen, that sounds so uh, random if somebody would walk up to you and say, strike me, hit me. Imagine if you're out on Wadsworth and somebody walks up and says, punch me in the face, thus saith the Lord. (laughs) Now, looking at Pastor Isaac, he probably would do it. (laughs) He called it the laying on a hands ministry. But it's so random, you know, and the first guy says, no, I'm not going to do it. I read this, and I remembered when my parents were going to spank me. My dad would show me the belt, and you see, in a Puerto Rican family, there's no such thing as timeout. That's a white family thing. That's not a Puerto Rican. In the Puerto Rican house, it's time is up. It is. So my dad would show me the belt, and he would say, Randy, you asked for this. Now, I thought that was cruel and unusual punishment because I would look at him and say, excuse me, I did what? He said, you asked for this. And I'd say, well, can we discuss it? Well, no, there's no discussion. You asked for this. When you didn't do what I told you to do, you asked for it. Now you're going to get it. And he was more than willing to give it. And I thought, well, we need to discuss this. But there was no discussion. And this prophet is standing on the street and he's saying, strike me, hit me, thus saith the Lord. Hit me with a sword, cut me, hit me hard. And the first guy says, no, I'm not going to do it. That's so random. And he says, well, since you won't do it, I'm going to call a lion out of the forest. Since you will not be obedient to the voice of God, I'm calling a lion out of the forest, and he is going to eat you. Well, as soon as he calls the lion out, the lion comes and he's eating him. And while he's eating him, the prophet immediately goes to find another man, and he says, strike me. Hit me, thus saith the Lord. And the second man, without hesitation, pulls a sword, and I can almost imagine him saying, okay, where do you want it? Because I imagine that, you know, word got out pretty quick. I don't want to be lunch for a lion. So the Bible says he hits him, and he strikes him without hesitation, inflicting major damage, a major wound. Now notice this story is really amazing. Because the story teaches us that when you see things in the Bible and in your life that you do not understand. Always remember to pause and take a long look at the situation. Because there are lessons to be learned in the things you don't understand. You have to learn to see things from God's perspective. You must develop a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview basically understands that 
We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Every dot, every jot, every tittle of it. That means every exclamation point in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. And so we filter everything in our life through God's word. Not through the Republican, Democrat, Independent Tea Party. Not through CNN, not through Fox News work. I know that some of you think Fox is the greatest thing in the world. And you think, you know, every good Christian watches Fox. Well, listen, they are just as political pundits as the rest. Oh, hear me now. And they're speaking an agenda. So you filter everything through a biblical world view. And the first thing I want you to see is in this story is the prophet found another man rather quickly to accomplish God's plan. If you don't have an appetite for the call of God on your life, and what God has told you to do, the life God has given you, if you don't take advantage of the opportunities and the doors that are open and the revival spirit that is here, and the times when God says, I want you to move, I want you to do something, if you decide not to do it because you don't understand why God would ask you to do a certain thing, God always has someone else. God always has another body of believers that if you don't, you be, if you don't be obedient, he says, I can always use somebody. I want to use you. I have a plan to use you, but I don't have to use you. I could raise up another church. I could raise up another man. I could raise up another woman. And their obedience to the voice of God will allow them to experience amazing things in their life because I do have a plan. I do have a purpose. And I would like to use Southwest Assembly. I don't have to. I would like to. And if you don't want to be used of me, I can always raise someone else up. It all all depends upon will you obey me even in the things you don't understand and the Bible says the second man struck him and notice the text wounded him he was visibly wounded the prophet was bleeding and had to have damages placed over his eyes then the prophet as soon as he is uh, as soon as he is dressed, the wounds are dressed, the Lord says, go stand on the corner for the king is passing by. Ahab is coming by with his chariot and his entourage, and he's coming down the street. And now that he has been wounded, and now that he has been hurt, he now has something about him that qualifies him to give the message to the most powerful man in the nation. Listen, God was teaching the prophet. And he's teaching you and I. He's using him as an illustrated sermon. Friends, don't miss this. The prophet had to go through the wounding process or the king would have never stopped and listened to him. But God would give him a word. But God also knew that this prophet was not qualified, positioned, and prepared to give the word until he had been wounded, until he had been hurt, until he had lived through some tears and had some bleeding and some suffering and some emotional pain. It would be the bandages and the wounds that would get the king's attention. If it wasn't for the bandages and the wounds, the king would have passed him by. There were many other people, I imagine, lining the street. It's a parade. The king of Israel is coming. And he would have passed on by. So many times, we think it's our talent that will bring us before great people. We think it's our money or our education or our personal abilities, and certainly that helps. I, I am not against your education. I have education. We all need it. But when it really comes down to it, I have found out in 35 years of ministry that the sermons that reach people the most and touch them the most are not the ones that are intellectual or filled with Bible facts and theology. All of those are important. We need the doctrinal foundation. We need to understand those things. But it's the sermons that have come out of my woundings and my hurts. Times when I've been bruised. Times when I've been cut. And I've walked through the message through the valley of the shadow of death. Those sermons have a weight and an anointing. They give me an authority from heaven because they have been birthed in Gethsemane. The olive press. And there's a heaviness behind those words that can pierce through the heart. 
where talent and education and smart ideas cannot reach a hardened sinner, a hardened generation with no morals, ethics, or integrity. I mean, we're talking about wicked King Ahab. He's married to wicked Queen Jezebel. The Bible says they did more to dishonor God than any other king and queen in the history of the nation of Israel. Nobody could reach them. Nobody could get to them except a man with a word from the Lord that had been wounded and he's been hurt and he was bleeding and he's standing on the side of the road. And the very thing that we run away from is what God was going to use to reach the king. Let that sink in. Because we want a perfect life. We want no wounds, no hurts, beautiful families. That's the American dream. No issues to ever hit us. And when it does, we sulk, we sour, we give up and fail to understand that the anointing comes out of crushing. Many will email the office or they'll Facebook, they watch us on Tuesdays and Thursdays, my coffee with Rev, and they'll put a little remark there on, on the Facebook page. Oh, I, I want a greater anointing. I, I want the anointing that kind of that you have, Pastor Randy. I, and I always email or text back and say, be careful what you ask for. Because the anointing comes out of crushing. The anointing is the personality of the Holy Spirit. And it comes out of crushing. The anointing is birthing Gethsemane. And the prophet was wise enough to have an attitude that said, God, if this is what it takes, the wounds and the hurts for me to help somebody else because of what I have been through, If this is what it takes to have a greater anointing, if this is what it takes to have more of the Holy Spirit rise from within me and land upon me in times of crisis, compromise, and opportunity, then this is what I want because it takes, if this is what it takes for a breakthrough, then God use my wounds to bring healing and help to someone else. Friends, please understand this deep biblical truth. God will always use life's wounds to speak to hurting people. Oh, don't miss it. Your wounds carry a message in them. It doesn't matter how hard they are, how wicked they are, how drunk they are. It doesn't matter how high they are. It doesn't matter how many lovers they have had. When they encounter someone like you, when they encounter someone like me who is speaking a word from the Lord, and that person has been qualified and quantified by their own wounds and their own hurts and their own failures and their own heartache in their life, and they've been set free and delivered by the power of God's grace and God's mercy. Friends, there's something about that that carries the weight of the anointing that is abili- has the ability to set people free. To set them free. Now, someone listening to me might be thinking, well, Randy, I have a valid excuse not to be a good dad, not to be a good mother, because I never had one. Well, you can look at it that way, or you can stand up and say, yes, I have been wounded, I have been hurt, but I took my bruises to Jesus, and he took my deep emotional scars to the cross, and he covered me with his mercy, and he covered me with his grace. And his precious precious blood that was spilled at the cross covered my sin and covered my shame. And he has brought me healing and deliverance. And when I repented of my sin, he adopted me as his own. And now I am a joint heir with Christ. And because I am a joint heir with Christ, I can stand on God's promises recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 that boldly tell me, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, old things pass away. Behold, all things become new again. If you're thankful for that, I want someone to shout amen and clap your hands that you have come into the adoption with Jesus. My Lord, because of that adoption, I can now break the cycle of generational curse. I can now break the cycle of dysfunction. My children and their children and their future children can live a life of victory and anointing because what the devil has meant for naught, 
God has turned to good, and now the Holy Spirit can transfer blessing to my family. He can transfer healing to my family. He can bring a godly heritage to my children and my grandchildren, and the wounds that were meant to harm can be used for the blessing and the anointing and the power of God and not destroy but bring healing. Oh, come on, somebody. If you believe what I'm preaching, I want you to clap your hands and praise him that God's going to use you in spite of the hurt. Oh, come on, praise him. Yes. Well, I know immediately some look back and say, well, Randy, you just don't understand how bad I've been hurt. No, you don't understand that now that you have been hurt and attacked and wounded, you can be highly effective in leadership. Oh, catch that. See, we think that leaders have to be perfect. We see, you see us up in the pulpit or leading a class, and you think, well, their lives must be perfect. We see them, and, oh, they must never have a problem. They never have a situation. And if they do, they have it all together. They know how to deal with it. When in reality, the vast majority of true leaders have been wounded and bruised and deeply hurt, and we've made it through. They have fought the good fight of faith, but we have learned how to pray through. See, that's the key. You have to learn to pray through. You pray through the hurt. You pray through the pain. You pray to the victory. We stared the enemy down and we still are standing in faith by the grace of God through the power of the blood of Jesus. There's not a single person that has not been through a struggle. Friends, God wants you to know he can use that wound. He can use that scar. He can use that attack. He could use the pain of that divorce. He can use that sickness. He can use it for his glory. You just need to bring it to him. If God allowed that wound to come into your life and to come into your family, if he allowed the sword to hit you, it's only so he can give you a greater ability to communicate to someone else and say, you know, I I know exactly where you are. I know exactly what you're going through. I have been there, and by the grace of God, I have made it. He has never left me. He has never forsaken me. He has walked me through this thing, and if he has done it for me, he can do it for you. He can do it for you. And sometimes we think, uh, if I've been wounded, I can't lead. We think, I can't worship today with joy because I've had a such a hellish life. I can't lead other people. It's been a hellish week. If you knew the week I had, I can't lead in worship. I can't lift my hands. Those are lies from the pits of hell. I heard someone say, uh, we watched that movie yesterday, Jesus Revolution, and the pastor's wife turned to her husband and said, you know, the lies are the loudest. The truth is the most quiet. And she said, are we so arrogant to think That God can't use us even in our hurts. Wow. We think, I I can't get someone out of depression. I can't barely get myself out of depression. How in the world would God use me? Because that's what he does. He uses imperfect vessels. God spoke to Moses from a burning bush, basically saying, Moses, it's taken me 40 years to get you where you are. Take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy ground. Now that's a twofold promise from God. The place where you are standing is holy ground. Whenever God shows up, he is a holy God. So the two by four piece of real estate God is there with, he is going to bring his holiness. But it was a place of reception and ready to listen. Forty years in the wilderness, Moses was finally at the point where he had a place of reception and ready to listen. God had brought him through all those things, those woundings, those hurts, those pains. And now he's at a point, I've got to hear from God. He's at a point of reception and ready to listen. Are you ready to listen? Are you at a point that says, Lord, I've been through a whole lot. You've taken us through a whole lot. But if you can use me again, Lord, I'm at a point that I'm ready to listen. And God is saying, Moses, you've been on the backside of the desert long enough. I can use you now. Friends, if you don't believe me, when you get to heaven, you can ask Jonah, the wrong way prophet. You can ask Samson, the he-man with a she-weakness. 
let that one sink in. When I get to heaven, I'm going to go find Samson. And I'm going to say, hey, bro, listen, she tied you up twice. <laughs> Duh. She must have been really good looking because she tied him up twice. And then she even said, Samson, baby, can you tell me your, your, your secret so that I might afflict you? Listen, guys, if your woman says she wants to afflict you, you got a problem. No matter how good looking she is, you got a problem. And God used Samson, the he-man, with a she-weakness. How about Gideon hiding in a wine press? Mighty man of valor. The Stephen Urkel of the Bible. <laughs> and the Bible says, in my weakness you are made strong. Talk about wounds that heal. Talk about wounds that God uses to bring revival. Time would fail me to tell you about the Moabites whose family and lineage was so evil, God said the Moabites were no longer allowed in the temple. It all started for a young lady by the name of Ruth who happened to be a Moabitess. There was a famine in the land, and a young family was searching for their own answers. They left behind Bethlehem of Judea, and they land in Moab. Moab is a place where men go to die. The word Moab means out of self. And the reason that the Moabites were so evil is the Moabites were the descendants of Abraham's nephew, Lot. And the Bible said that Lot set his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Now listen to me very carefully. When the, the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his family are pulled out. Notice we never hear that Lot marries a wife until he gets to Sodom and Gomorrah. So we know that he has hooked himself up with someone who's not a believer. And the angels come into Sodom and Gomorrah, and the men are so twisted, they're, they're, they are so evil, they tell Lot, we want to have sex with those men, send them out, the angels of the Lord send them out, and Lot says, no, I'll send you out my virgin daughters, and the virgin daughters are listening, and you can only imagine the trauma as they're thinking to themselves, Dad, are you really going to send us out there? Oh, let me teach you a little. And when the angels destroy the city, Lot and his wife and his two daughters are leaving. The wife who grew up in sin, the wife who grew up in a culture, turns back and looks back in fondness. And the Lord says, I'm going to show all of the world what I've been looking at for your entire life. And she turns outwardly to a pillar of salt. But understand, her heart was already hard towards God. The daughters thinking that all the world had been destroyed, they're a little bitter and angry, and they get their father drunk that night. I love the Bible because it tells us the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> I mean, the Bible don't hold anything back. And they get their father drunk, and they have physical relations with their dad. And the first daughter gets pregnant, and she has a child, and it's a son, and she names him Moab, which means out of self. The second daughter gets pregnant, and she has another son and names him Amnon. So now we have the Moabites and the Amalekites, the two most wicked nations that become enemies of the nation of Israel that started in the family. Oh, follow me now. And they become so wicked that God says, you no longer are allowed in the temple. Fast forward 200, 300 years, there's a young woman by the name of Ruth, a Moabitess, who her lineage is in incest, her lineage is in drunkenness, her lineage is in hurt and pain. Oh, come on now. And this other family comes out of Bethlehem of Judea. The father's name is Elimelech. His wife is named Naomi. Their two sons are called Malon and Chilion. And they go because they should have never left the church. But it got so hard, they stopped trusting God. And they started trusting themselves. And they end up in Moab. Whenever you trust yourself, get ready for problems. Have I started teaching you yet? 
And they get their sons to Moab, and the sons fall in love with two Moabite women, which is fairly predictable. One is named Orpha, and the other is named Ruthie. And the men die in the famine. And the mother-in-law, Naomi, turns to her daughter-in-law and says, I have no more sons to give you. You have to make a choice. I'm going back to Bethlehem of Judea. I hear there's fresh bread in Bethlehem of Judea. I should have never left. Isn't that the way it is? I should have never left, but you have to make your choice. And Orpha chooses to go back to bondage. She chooses to go back to Moab. There are some people that will always choose to go back to bondage. It breaks your heart. But Ruthie looks at her mother-in-law. Orpha walks away tearfully, never to be heard of again. And Ruth refused to depart from Naomi, not knowing what hardships or heartaches lay ahead in a foreign land. She chooses to cling to what was left of her new family rather than return to the old. Her words are recorded in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Ruth turns to her mother-in-law and says, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And the underlying understanding is she was ready for a new life. Ruth was prepared to step out in faith and see what this God of Israel had to offer. She was ready to move from bruised to blessed. From bruised to blessed. Is there anyone here that is ready to move from bruised to blessed? If you are, someone shout amen. Amen. As David would later put it, she was ready to taste and see that the Lord is good. David would be her future great-great-grandson. And the moment that she said what she did, God the Father said, that's good enough for me, baby. I know you're coming out of bruises. You're coming out of pain. But I'm going to use that for my glory. And I'm going to put you in the lineage of the Messiah. Are you open to the possibilities that he might bless you in an unexpected, perhaps startling way? Who says you know what's next for your life, Southwest Assembly? Who says God can't use you in a dramatic, holy, unexpected way? Who says he can't lead you into a season of life and ministry beyond anything you've ever experienced or even dreamed? Just who is the limiting factor today? Is it God? Or are we capable of closing our hearts to what he wants to do and through our lives because of fear, doubt, worry, and the lies of hell? Listen, we've all been through the battles of life. We've all been shot at by attacks of hell. Get rid of the excuses. You're not the only one that is hurt in the room. Your adult children can wound you. A marriage can wound you. And family can wound you. A job situation can wound you. A business deal that's gone bad can wound you. Oh, listen to this. Friendly fire can wound you. A relationship that you were so wonderful and you were so close and somehow it went sideways and now you're being bruised and it seems like it will never heal. What I'm saying to you is if you stay obedient and do what God tells you to do, you will get through it. Some say, well, I want him to take it all away, Pastor. Well, listen, there are some scars that will never go away. Some wounds will never go away. But you will get through it. And many times you don't choose which sword comes your way. You don't choose which wounds come into your life. Some things just hit you out of nowhere and you say, where in the world did that come from? Did not see that coming. It just hits you and you say, I I don't understand it, Lord. No, you don't choose the sword. You don't choose the wound, but you do choose your response. And you can become an alcoholic or you can become an overcomer. 
You can become bitter and sour and angry and unforgiving and mad at God and mad at the church and mad at the pastor and mad at the Bible. Or you could say like Job, like Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away and he is going to work it for my good. And in the end, I'll be standing with all of my children and all of my grandchildren in the eternity called heaven. So blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hear it again. You don't choose which sword hits you, but you do choose your response. Let me give you two women who had a chance to choose. One chose well and one chose poorly. In 1 Samuel chapter 1 or chapter 4, there's a story of a woman, the daughter-in-law of Eli the high priest. She's married to Eli's son, Phineas. She was in the process of giving birth. And while she's in labor and delivery, a servant came into the room where she was. And the servant tells her, the Ark of the Covenant has been stolen by the Philistines. Now she hears the news that the presence of God, the Ark of God, the favor of God has been stolen. Remember, in the Ark were three things. Aaron's rod, which represents God's leadership. The Ten Commandments, God's law, and the manna, God's provision. God's law, God's leadership, and God's provision has been stolen, and it seems like it will never return. She's in labor and delivery. She is struggling to give birth. And then the same servant says, oh, and by the way, your father-in-law, the high priest, the one who stands before God for the nation of Israel, he heard the ark was stolen, and in his surprise, he falls backwards off his rocking chair, hits his head on a rock, and breaks his neck, and now we have nobody to stand for us before God. And then he says, oh, by the way, I mean, who let this guy in the room? You would think somebody would have got the guy out. But he goes, oh, by the way, uh, even worse news. Your husband has been killed in battle. Now remember, you don't choose which sword and which wounds come into your life. But you do choose your response. And the Bible says she's then overcome by her birth pains, which is a very nice way of saying she's about to die because it's been very difficult and she gives birth to a son, and the nursemaid runs around just before she dies, and she says to her, you've given birth to a son, what would you like to name him? And she says, name him Ichabod, meaning the glory of God has departed. She names the child Ichabod because the pain they were going through in their present generation. She decided to pass their pain to the next generation. And when she names him Ichabod, she goes on to say, the glory of God has departed from my life, my marriage, my family, my home, my nation. There's no more happiness in my life. There's no more joy in my life. There's just depression. She just named the child Ichabod or whatever I am presently going through because the glory has departed. Listen, she let her present wounds speak to her future generation. Never, never, never allow your present negative wounds to name your future. It's easy sometimes to get into a bad season. I understand that. But you don't have to allow what's happening in your present to name your future. She could have very easily named him, the glory will come again. She could have very easily said, my God is able she could have very easily said, my God is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But she allowed her present negative circumstance to prophesy the fulfillment of her future. We have a choice on how we respond to life's wounds. Can you imagine every time that child came back into the family, came into the house, it was a constant reminder, oh, there's Icky. It's your fault. He was a constant reminder. Do you know there are people that never let things die? And they're constantly bringing up dead things. Constantly bringing up. When are we going to learn to let those dead things lie and say the glory of God is coming again? Never allow your present day situation to be passed to your sons and daughters. There's another story we need to look at. 
In 1 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 16, there's a family miracle listed that I, you've got to see. They're listing out the family of King David. They start with his father, Jesse, then his brothers. And in verse 16, David's sisters are listed, and it gives us their names. The sisters of King David were Zerah and Abigail. And then the scripture goes on to tell us Zerah's three sons were Abishai, Joab, and Hesheu. Now, again, it's very important to realize names in the Bible carry great significance. They would name a child to mark an event or a life experience, hence Ichabod, hence Moab. You don't choose the sword, but you choose your response. The name Zerah in Hebrew, David's sister, means my wounds, my pain, my suffering, my tribulation. And the commentaries that I read said it was widely believed there was a visible, horrible wound somewhere on the face of this little girl. That something had happened in her childhood. We have no idea what it was. We don't know if she was burned or if she was injured. But we know that something happened to the point that it caused her parents to name her Zara, my tribulation, my wounds, my pain, my hurt. But something amazing happens through this woman because her offspring do not receive a transfer of the issues of her life. And I can prove it because she raises three amazing champions for God. One is named Joab. Joab became the four-star general and the commander of the army of Israel under King David. Joab stood side by side with great warrior Uncle David, his uncle, helping David to lead the armies of Israel to the greatest victories and the expansion of the nation of Israel, even to this day. One of the greatest warriors in the history of the nation of Israel was Joab. The next son was Abishai. In 2 Samuel 23, it tells us David was advanced in years. That's a nice way of saying David's old. <laughs> Pastor Brummett is advanced in years. <laughs> I am advanced in years, I've told some of you. And he's out there, and David is out there, and he's fighting a giant. And the Bible says he's out there advanced in years, and he's exhausted in the battle. I, I, I read this in my office, and I started to kind of chuckle to myself because I could see David, you know, inside his mind, he's still the warrior. He's still the boy that flung the, the stone that killed the giant. In his mind, he's thinking, I still got it. Because in my mind, I think the same thing. And in David's mind, he's thinking, you're 28. And the, and the Lord is saying, no, you're not no more. See, in my mind, I think I'm 28. The Bible says, no, you're almost 58. The Holy Spirit says, you're almost 58. As the Bible says, he was exhausted. He's fighting the giant, but the giant knocks him down. And the giant wants to kill him and cut his head off because he killed their champion, Goliath. And he pulls the sword, and he's just about to cut the head of King David off when suddenly, from across the battlefield, there is a war cry that is heard. And the giant pauses, and he looks up, and he sees a man running towards him. It is Abishai, the son of my wounds, is running to the battle. That should make you want to shout. If his mother would have transferred wounds and hurt and depression and self-pity and fear and worry, he would have never, ever, ever entered the battle. But when King David is laying on the ground and the giant's about to cut his head off, here comes the son of my wounds. And he gets between Uncle David, not only his king, but his uncle. And he pulls his sword. I'm reading this, and the tears were flowing when I realized what was happening. I want you to visualize exactly what's taking place. The psalmist of Israel is laying on the ground. The giant slayer, the one who slayed the lion and the bear, the one who wrote almost the entire book of Psalms. David, the man after God's own heart, he's laying there. And here comes his nephew, the son of my wounds. And he comes into the battle. And the Holy Spirit whispered, mijo, because the Holy Spirit's Puerto Rican. <laughs> yeah. You'll find out when you get to heaven, believe me. This tells us that you never stop fighting for your family. Even if your family has a checkered history like David with Bathsheba. Ooh, glory to God. 
You never stop praying. You never stop fighting. You never stop fasting. You never stop believing. You go and you say, Lord, I'm going to stand in the gap against the giants of life that dare to come against my family. Southwest Assembly, you hear me. Every time the devil attacks your pastor and his family, you better take it personal. Every single time he attacks your pastoral staff, you take it personal. Sir, every time the devil attacks your children, your grandchildren, your in-laws, you take it personal. And you rise up under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, just like Abishai. And you say, no, 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 no. I'm coming into the battle. I'm not going to allow you to come into my family and steal the blessing and steal the joy and steal the things of God. And he runs into the battle. And the Bible says he kills the giant that day. And God brought about a great victory. And to this day, David and Abishai are the only two men listed as being giant slayers in Scripture. Hallelujah. So don't tell me you can't do it. The third son was Ashiel. Scripture says he was the fastest runner in all of Israel. He could run like the wind. And if you read Scripture, many believe he was one of the men that went with another through the Philistine army just to get a drink for his uncle because King David said, oh, that I could have a drink from the wells of Bethlehem. He's out in the battle. He's sitting in his tent out in the battlefield. Oh, that I could have a drink from the wells of Bethlehem. Dr. Jack Hayford, who I was reading, he said he believed it was Ashiel and another warrior that took the king's goblet. And Ashiel, as fast as the wind, ran through the Philistine army, goes to Bethlehem, dips the king's cup in, the, and then he brings it back to David. David doesn't drink from it. If you read it, he pours it out because he says, I can't, I can't indulge myself when you guys are out here doing this to me. And that just causes this young man to even love his, his uncle even more. When you start to see the insight, here is a woman who names, means my wounds. She's carried the scars and the wounds all of her life, but instead of letting them produce bitterness and pain and sorrow, depression and addiction, curses and bondage, low self-esteem and no confidence, instead of her saying, we can't do anything, she raises four champions in one household with her wounds. One becomes a four-star general. One becomes a giant slayer. The third becomes the fastest, most greatest athlete in the nation of Israel. I know you've been wounded. I know if you're a single mom, you've been hurt. I know if you're a single dad, you've gone through things. And I know, I know that I'm looking at a group of folks that say we have reached a point in our life, Randy. We don't know economically if we can do anything. We can't reach this city. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Because you can raise champions for God in this church. And my closing question to you is this. Southwest Assembly. What will your wounds produce? Will they produce bitterness and unbelief and addiction and laziness? Will they produce a church that takes the blessings of God and the bread of life and the riches of God and buries them and indulges themselves in a revival spirit? What will you produce? The Apostle Paul said, well, he had it all, by the way. He had intellect, he had education, he was gifted. But he said, I don't glory in any of that. I glory in my infirmities. I glory in my wounds. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned to death. He was beaten with a cat of nine tails. He was shipwrecked. He was snake bit, tortured, and left for dead. And yet when he asked God to take away the pain, God says, no, 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 I'm not going to take it away. I'll never take it away. My grace is sufficient for you in my strength, in your weakness, my strength will be made perfect. And we know from the Bible that God is always working in our life for good, but the Bible also says we're going to hit some hard times. That's part of life. No one can escape it. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. 
Jesus explained this in John 16, 33, when he said, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. Friends, there are two ways you can deal with your trial. There are two ways you can deal. I already showed you Ichabod, the glory is departed, or Zerah, my wounds to produce champions. You can either let them break you, or you can trust that God will use them for something good. Yes, and God will always leave the choice up to you. Your worst day can lead to your best opportunities for growth and ministry. I'm speaking to a man here that needs to begin to mentor other young men. And you're saying, well, I can't do it. I, I've been too wounded. I don't know what to say. Friend, God never wastes a hurt. And he never wants you to waste a hurt. He doesn't want you just to trudge through it. He wants you to mature through it and then use your experience to help others facing the same situation. For instance, who can better help someone going through cancer than someone who's been walked through cancer and God has helped you through it? Who else can help someone going through a painful divorce than the child of God that's gone through a painful divorce and you're still standing and you're still praising and you're still moving under the anointing of God? Who else can help a young family navigate financially their problems as their house is getting ready to go into repossession than someone who says, I've been there? I know. See, most people can bring good out of good, but God can bring good out of bad. Come to the piano for me, brother. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1.4, he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Paul is describing something the Bible calls redemptive suffering. Let, let me teach you a little like they would in a, in, a, in a Bible class. Redemptive suffering is what Jesus dealt with when he went to the cross for you. Remember, he's the Lamb of God. He's the sinless, flawless Lamb of God. He didn't have to go to the cross. In fact, the man part of him says, Father, if, if it's possible... May this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. And then there's a scripture there, read it when you get home about the Garden of Gethsemane. There's a little line in the King James that puts it all into perspective. It says, then Jesus looked through time. And he says, for the ones who have not come yet, I will go to the cross. I looked up that phrase, sis, in the Aramaic, it actually means, for the ones who are not yet even born. In other words, God looked through the eons of time. He saw February, the last Sunday, in 2003. He saw Southwest Assembly of God. And he saw you sitting in that chair. And he said, Mijo. For you, I'll go to the cross. So that when those trials hit and the enemy hits, you could have a choice. It's called redemptive suffering. And the Lord told this prophet, go stand on the corner. Don't you know the prophet must have thought, why in the world am I asking this guy to hit me? But he said, out of obedience, Lord, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I was reading the rest of the narrative, and it says when the prophet lifted up his wounds and the king looked in his eyes, that's when he realized, this is the dude I've been running from. He went away sorrowfully knowing that his kingdom was about to come to an end. Wow. Now listen, I want to be used of God. And let me share it with you so that I'm not, you know, you're not confused. I want to be used of God, but I'm not going to go stand out on Wadsworth and say, Lord, have a bus run over my feet so I can preach better. I'm not volunteering for that. And I'm not, I'm not going to go outside during a storm, a lightning storm in Springfield, Missouri. We have these gully washers. And say, Lord, let lightning hit my house. Or, let, Lord, let it hit me so I could preach better. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. 
But what I am saying is since we are all in this world, and we are not of this world, and since we're all going to face trials and tribulations, we have a choice. Why don't we choose today as a body of believers to say, Lord, here's our wounds, here's our hurt, here's our pain, here's what we have dealt with, but we know you are able, God. We know you are El Shaddai. We know you're Jehovah Jireh. We know you're Jehovah Shalom. You are God, our provider. And since we are here for a short time, if this is what it's going to take, Lord, for me to use, to be used, to get to somebody else, then here's my wounds. Here's my hurt. Here's my pain. Here's the things I've gone through. Lord, you breathe on it, and you make me a greater anointed person than I've ever been. Lord, here's my blood, sweat, and tears. Here's my worry. Here's my fear. Here's my doubt. Now take me and use me for your glory. Use me for your glory. Lord, give me the words to mentor young men. Ladies, there's somebody here that you need to rise up to a ministry task. And we need to take this revival spirit and begin to take it to the ones that are hurting. And say, I've been there. Let me show you the love of God. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Are you hungry to be used of God? Don't believe the lies of hell that says you can't be used. In the words of Chuck Smith's wife, are we so arrogant to believe that God can't use us? Listen, I just laid out for you, he used a woman named Ruth who came from a heritage of pure evil. He used Moses, a murderer. He used David, a womanizer. He used Samson, who was frail in his emotions. God says, that's, that's how I operate. And he wants to use Southwest Assembly of God to reach Lakewood for Jesus. If that's you, I want you right now to begin to pray. Don't you dare pray quietly, but say, Lord, here's our wounds, here's our hurt, here's our bruises. I want you right now to intercede for the lost. Come on, church, right now, all over this room. Call your children by name. Call your grandchildren by name. I want you to call them now from the east, the west, the north, and the south. You've been restricted far too long. This is a prophetic word for this church. God is calling right now. He's calling young ladies and young men to the ministry. He's calling you to do things for God. After this service, many of you are going to go to Pastor Jim and say, Jim, Pastor, would you use me? Put me somewhere. Put me somewhere, Lord. There are some of you that you're advanced in years already, and you need to be rebaptized. You need to get into the water tank all over again because you don't remember the time when you were baptized. Maybe you were baptized as a child. Maybe you were sprinkled or whatever it is. The Bible doesn't tell us that we only can be baptized once. It says when you come to a realization that it's time to be used again. And I'm looking at a group of people that there are many of you need to get in the tank again and say, Lord, I'm laying down my flesh. I'm laying down again, and I'm rising up under the anointing of God for such a time as this. If you are still here in this room, I don't care if you're 70 years old or 80 years old. If you're still alive, God's got a purpose. God's got a plan. God's got a call. We've got young people that need mentoring. We've got children that need to be raised up. We've got people that need to know Jesus loves them. And the reason we have a culture in America that is broken is because Americans don't know how much Jesus loves them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Sis, I want you to turn around and lay hands on that young lady right there and that young man. I don't know them. I've never met them. I've never even seen them before. But I want you to lay hands upon them right there.
in the name of Jesus. Church, begin to pray. God is calling young families. I believe this church needs to begin right now to invest in the local college and the local university. In the name of Jesus, Pastor, I want you to lay hands on these people right here, right behind you. Just lay hands on all of them. Turn around, Gene. Turn around, lay hands. Turn around right there. God wants you to begin to reach out to the colleges and the universities. Lay hands upon them. For they are on the front line. The love of God to rise in us, Lord. To take our resources. Father, I pray a multiplication anointing on the resources of this church that they might begin to pour life into the colleges, that they might begin to pour life into Chi Alpha, that they might be able to pour life into the hurting and the lost. Lord, we need a new building. We're too restricted here, God. We need a new building. Somebody begin to pray God-sized prayers. Somebody like Abishai, run to the battlefield. I want a war cry to rise in this church. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We are set free. We are anointed of God. In the name of Jesus. I got to get you to this altar. At the count of, would you stand? I want everyone to stand. Just stand right now. Right now, right now. I want you to lift your hands to heaven. Just lift them to heaven. I want the rest of the praise team to come. Don't stop praying for those kids. I want you right now to lift up the prayer. Come on, lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. At the count of three, I'm going to call you to this altar. And when you step out, I want you to bring your wounds. I want you to bring your hurt. I want you to bring everything you've ever been through. And I want you to lay it at the altar and say, here it is, Lord. Here I am, an imperfect vessel. Lord, use me for your glory. Use me for your glory. Holy Spirit, that you would call radically young people to be used of God on the college campuses. Lord, that you would bring a spirit of love and anointing and intercession in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That you would raise up a generation of Abishai's and jo Joab's and Asiel, Lord. That you would raise up Zerah to begin to preach the gospel in this place. At the count of three, I want you to fill this altar right now. Don't you hesitate. Don't you wait. In the name of Jesus, I want you to run to the battle. Just like Abishai ran to the battle, I want you to run to the battle. At the count of three, one, two, three. Right now, right now. Come on. Come on. Lead us to something, guys. Lead us to something. In the name of Jesus.